So I know we're still getting settled, but I'm going to get started as we find more chairs and find space in the room. It's really exciting to see all of you here. I'm Cheryl Jones Walker. I'm a professor in educational studies and um, also in the Black Studies program. And today we have the distinct pleasure of hearing from five students in Professor Dorsey's Black Liberation 1969 course. Um, that subtitle of the course is Black Studies in History, Theory, and Praxis, and it's a research seminar that focused on the black student movement at Swarthmore College. Dr. Dorsey initiated this course in celebration of the 150th anniversary of the college. Black Liberation 1969 was designed to investigate and document the black student protests from the fall of 1968 to the spring of 1972. And it required students to analyze primary source documents and develop skills in oral history techniques in order to design, conduct, transcribe, and edit interviews. Each of the students in this course wrote a historical narrative um, that was based on a particular element of the student activism of the time. And in addition, they have designed and implemented or are in the process of implementing creative projects the, that will engage the wider community in the topics um, that they studied. As a product of this work, the students and also their colleagues who worked on this in the summer as summer researchers and Dr. D Dorsey with her dedication and direction have created the first comprehensive database, Black Liberation 1969, a digital archive. I've also heard that this project may not have been possible without the generous support and guidance of Nabil Kashap, right, new, um, Swathmore's new librarian for digital um, initiatives and scholarship. So this database is live and public publicly accessible and the students have created this pamphlet just to kind of orient you to some of the activities that are going on so the the site is there and also the map of where some of the creative projects will be shared um, so now you have some background about this work and I want to introduce you to each of the student speakers who are and I'll share just their name their major and the topic that they'll present today um, and I suspect through their stories we'll learn about um, the variety of ways that student activism transforms Swarthmore College, such as giving birth to the Black Cultural Center, creating the Black Studies program, and initiating faculty tenure lines that would be occupied for, by black faculty. So first to my right is um, Elise Ansal who's a senior and a special major in history and educational studies. Her, research, her narrative explored black philosophies of liberation, student activism, and institutional identity. Next is Laura Letterman, a senior majoring in physics, who unpacked diversity at Swarthmore, looking at the periods of 1964 to 1970 and today. Um, and then is Xavier Lee, class of 2017, who's a major in English literature, and he researched the Black Studies program at Swarthmore from 1968 to 1970. Um, and finally, no, not finally, we also have Maria Miha, class of 2015, who's a history major who researched the perspectives on class and the black student um, movement between 1968 and 1973. And finally, we have Alison Sch Schultz, She's also class of 2015, and her historical narrative was entitled From Behind Closed Doors, The Crisis of Control Within the Faculty in Response to the 1969 SAS Occupation. So each of them will have approximately 10 to 12 minutes to share their work, and then we'll leave some time for questions and answers. We are um, videotaping this, so please remember to turn off your devices, and I will turn it over to them. Alice. Thank you to Professor Jones Walker for that introduction, and thanks to all of you for coming today. We're really excited to be here and share and reflect on all the work that we've done this semester. My name is Elise Anasal. As Professor Jones Walker mentioned, I am a history and educational studies major here at SWAT. And I mentioned this again to provide some context for my project. My research paper is titled Black Philosophies of Liberation, Student Activism and Institutional Identity. Black Philosophies of Liberation was the title given to the student-led course in the spring of 1969. The syllabus and class notes, which are available on the archive, um, provide us some information into the class format and conversations. The course was designed as an overview of the evolution and diversity of then contemporary black history and thought. 
Student notes show how responsibility was divided by subject, with different students responsible, for example, for leading discussion about early Du Bois' writings versus later Du Bois. So we see here that they're exploring sort of these different trajectories of black thought. And student participants included Andrea White Kelly, Delmar Thompson, Francina King, Harold Buchanan, Karen Johnson, Marilyn Alman May, Marilyn Hollifeld, Michael Huckles, Russell Frisbee, and Ruth Wilson, among others. Most class participants had been directly involved with the admissions office sit-in of the preceding month, unsurprisingly, perhaps. <laughs> so from an educational perspective, or rather the perspective of an ed studies major, I saw the course's existence and content as incredibly important and revealing both about student interests and experiences at the college. From a historian's perspective, I also understood that the context at Swarthmore and nationally was particularly significant in trying to understand sort of the implications of this course. So I'll begin with a quote from one of the R alumni. In her interview for the Black Liberation Database, alumni activist Marilyn Almon May reflected on the course's creation. She said, we went to whatever dean was in charge and said, you're not giving us anything. We're here. We want to learn this. You don't have a professor, but we're Swarthmore students, well-read, well-versed. We think we can organize our own course. So faced with the inaction of Swarthmore's administration in response to the student demands for relevant coursework, students created black philosophies of liberation to meet their own intellectual needs and curiosity. So when we see this course in the context of student activism at Swarthmore, it's important to see the class itself as a form of protest and direct action following the protests of January 1969. Seeing in this, this course in this way allows us to locate it and the activism of Swarthmore students in this period more generally at, in a larger black campus movement. My argument, therefore, in my paper becomes that student organizing around relevant pedagogy at Swarthmore, as reflected in the creation of this course, is part of a larger trend in the black campus movement at college campuses across the United States. Looking at different narratives of the movement in media coverage, alumni interviews, and historical monographs led me to this conclusion. Two monographs in particular I want to touch on that really are provided very important context for Swarthmore's activism within a larger campus movement. Historians Martha Biondi and Ibram X. Kendi, both of whom will have been on campus this month, explored different instances of campus activism in the late 60s. Together with the research I've been doing for my, my history thesis, which was separate from this class, but lots of overlap, <laughs> to, um, which my thesis is about the City College of New York's South Campus takeover by black and Puerto Rican student activists for two weeks in April and May of 1969. So it falls a little after the events at Swarthmore, but it's part of the same movement. So the literature on the black campus movement illuminates the parallels between say the protests at City College and Brooklyn College and Swarthmore's own protests. As at Swarthmore, for example, students at City College, Brooklyn College, and other institutions of higher ed pursued direct action after their futile attempts to engage administrations along legitimate channels about student demands failed to produce any significant results. At Brooklyn College, for example, students interrupted a faculty meeting after having their demands tabled for months. Askia Davis, Brooklyn College student and activist leader, said to the faculty, you will not shut your eyes any longer. Brooklyn College belongs to us, not you. SAS demands, like those at Brooklyn College, included calls for increased admissions efforts in recruiting black students and relevant support and academic programming. Authors like Biondi and Kendi help us locate the Swarthmore protests in this national moment and in national narratives of campus movements by highlighting these parallels. The specific institutional context, though, is perhaps the most important. And together, these contexts helped me understand the implications of the course's formation, which I explore m in greater detail in my paper. <laughs> but the specific, so to illustrate the significance of this course further, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the educational climate in the United States in the 1960s, and then looking at the context at Swarthmore in light of the protest activity of the preceding months. The first class meeting was on February 5th, which was less than three weeks after SAS students vacated the admissions office. And for them, it became sort of this logical next step for activists in light of the lack of administrative response to the demands that were articulated that January. 
Um, and after this, I'm going to talk a little bit more about how the course's legacy and implications are clearest when we see this context and when we look at the formation of the course as reflecting underlying questions about institutional identity and access. So in considering the larger educational landscape, we know, so in 1954, the Supreme Court's decision in Brown v. Board of Ed ruled that de jure segregation, or the separate but equal doctrines governing much of the US were legal. The effects of this ruling, however, were not immediately apparent, particularly to black Americans in the South. Many institutions, particularly education and service institutions, continued to try and preserve the white hierarchy and privilege that was reflected in the segregated United States. Scholars like Biondi and Kendi, though, explore the role of American institutions of higher education specifically in perpetuating racial hierarchies in the early and mid 20th century. So in addition to Biondi and Kendi's indictments of institutional efforts to preserve an older status quo, the syllabus of black philosophies of liberation provides a list of frustrated black voices, among them Harold Cruz, Stokely Carmichael, Malcolm X, W.B. Du Bois, and others who were also speaking to the failures of American institutions in this time. As, it's, as City College professor and activist Alan Ballard has said, black student disruption of the campus status quo is the inevitable consequence of the historical relationship of blacks to higher education. Furthermore, as stories of violent and nonviolent federally sanctioned white resistance to desegregation show, the black student movements of the 1960s were the inevitable consequence of the relationships of black Americans to American institutions generally. So in her notes from Black Philosophies of Liberation, Marilyn Almond May touches on these central questions posed by black intellectuals that we have a reading list for in the syllabus. Namely, as Askia Davis and Sass's contemporaries in the spring of 69 across the country articulated, can American institutions work for black Americans? The answer for Du Bois, Cruz, and others was only if black students demanded relevant educational programs in black history and thought. Black phil philosophies of liberation, we can see as the student's answer to this very question. Could Swarthmore's academic program meet the needs of black students? It wasn't, but Marilyn Almond May and her colleagues pushed the college to do so in creating and implementing this course. So while the course is fundamentally a testament to students' commitment to their intellectual and political growth, the contents and conversations of the course are also a testament to the political action and significance of this process of self-education, which was guided by Swarthmore students in the late 60s. At Swarthmore and at campuses around the US, student activists involved in conversations on college campuses around issues of access and institutional racism developed a powerful series of questions about how the society we live in sustains and generates inequality. The power of the student movement, therefore, lay both in the form it took and the challenge it presented to institutions isolated within superficial bubbles of liberalism and enlightenment. Understanding the context of black philosophies of liberation as a reflection of this speaks to the importance of this historical moment in institutional memory at Swarthmore College. While alumni interviews have shown that details of the course participation have faded from memory, which is understandable <laughs> since it was quite a while ago, it's clear that its role in a larger and political movement and process of black student empowerment was essential. The voices of the students who called for curricular and institutional changes continue to resonate today. As Sass entered the admissions office and Marilyn Almond May and her colleagues sat down for the first class meeting of black philosophies on February 5th, Theirs was a voice that echoed Askia Davis's sentiment as he asserted that Brooklyn College was just as responsible to him as to his white peers. While Brooklyn College was a public institution and Swarthmore, as we know, is private, in the context of conversations about the meaning of a liberal education, the fundamental question remains the same. Who should the college be responsible to? What are the goals of a liberal education? So to wrap up, I'm gonna to return to an earlier text from this semester. In the view from the trenches, Charles Payne, who's a civil rights scholar and education reformer, challenges historians of the civil rights movement to change the way that the story of this moment is taught. 
for pain, restricting narratives of civil rights activism to a frame of a few years suggests problematically that the struggle for equal rights and access ended with the end of the civil rights movement. While organizing efforts around education access and relevant curriculum came to a head at Swarthmore in 1969, the story does not end with the establishment of the Black Cultural Center or the presence of increased numbers of black administrators and faculty, nor does it end with the reality that Swarthmore still does not have the 10% black student body called for by SAS in 1968. As Payne writes of narratives of activism and civil rights organizing, we praise their courage while ignoring their questions. At Swarthmore, student activists raised questions that remain unanswered in the United States and at Swarthmore specifically, who exactly is a liberal education for? Thank you. Diversity is a word we hear a lot at Swarthmore. Swarthmore prides itself on its diversity. It covers its brochures with smiling faces of all different colors working together on a problem in the library. <laughs> but it seems to me that we don't really discuss how diversity became one of Swarthmore's core values or question what the purpose of this diversity is. Why does the college care about having a diversity of students? But at the same time, we do talk about diversity a lot most often in the moments in which incidents of overt racism have occurred. In these moments, students of color speak out about how they're made to feel like they don't belong at Swarthmore and how, while the college prides itself on their presence, they don't always feel supported to succeed. In these moments, students are questioning both what the college sees as the purpose of diversity as well as what the point of being here is for them. What are they trying to get out of their education? The first thing I noticed when I started doing research for this project was that the questions that were being asked then were exactly the same as these. And that makes sense, because the 1960s were a defining moment, the beginning of diversity at Swarthmore, the beginning of thinking about what admitting students not just from a homogenous background could look like, and what the goals of doing so were. Prior to the 1940s, there were no black students at Swarthmore. There are a couple of stories in the college's lore about early attempts made by black students to enroll. In 1905 or so, there was a student admitted to Swarthmore who the admissions committee had not realized was black during the application process. When he arrived at the college and they realized he was black, he was told that an error had been made and they were sorry, but he could not be permitted to enroll. In 1932, in a similar story, there was a black student who applied from Philadelphia who was otherwise entirely qualified. The admissions committee didn't know what to do with this, so they referred the matter to the board of managers. And the board decided that the time was not right for admitting a black male student to a co-educational school. It would raise too many problems and create too many difficulties. So it wasn't until about 1943 that the college finally ceded to years of student activism and agreed to admit students of any race. But even then, it was a trickle, one, two, maybe three a year. And then the civil rights movement happened, and elite historically white colleges became more aware of issues facing black Americans and began to realize their own role in maintaining racial segregation. I think it is worth noting that Swarthmore was fairly late to the game of admitting black students. Many of its peer institutions had been doing so for nearly 50 years by the time that Swarthmore admitted its first black students. But as the civil rights movement came to national prominence, and as schools across the country were ordered to desegregate, these colleges began to realize that perhaps they were not doing as much as they could. In November of 1963, a group of five colleges, Antioch, Grinnell, Occidental, Reed, and Swarthmore, applied together for a Rockefeller Foundation grant. The Rockefeller Foundation, among its various projects, was trying to increase access to higher education in order to alleviate the impact of poverty in black communities. In 1965, they described their fund as follows. Increasingly, thoughtful men assessing the cost to the nation of untapped human resources are hastening to the accession of deprived minorities, in particular Negroes, to the mainstream of economic and social advance. The Rockefeller Foundation is concentrating its efforts on projects designed to demonstrate how greater educational opportunities for Negroes and others might be achieved 
in the belief that for the long run, higher education appears as the most pressing need toward the realization of true equality. The Rockefeller Foundation was framing the purpose of black admissions as an attempt to solve the problems of society as it saw them. Swarthmore had a very similar perspective. The Dean of Admissions, Fred Hargadon, liked to use the phrase, the plight of the Negro with respect to higher education. And although not directly related to black admissions, a letter from Gilmore Stott, the assistant to the president, gave some more context about how Swarthmore saw these social problems. He wrote about the college's upward bound program helping individual slum young people and these plain poor kids on our own doorstep from a place nearly without hope. This place, as you may have guessed, was Chester. And I wanted to share these quotes to provide some context as to how the, how the college thought about itself in relationship to nearby black community. In April of 1964, Swarthmore received a $275,000 grant for the purpose of recruiting and paying the tuition of black students. And in its first two years, the college considered the grant very successful. The class of 1968 had 14 black students. The class of 1969 had 19. But by the time the class of 1970 was admitted, Hargadon had begun to suggest that the competition between elite colleges for a very limited number of qualified black students was becoming fierce. 12 men and 12 women had been admitted in the class of 1970, but only three men and seven women had enrolled. The class of 1971 again had 10 black students, and 1972 had only eight. In this context, Hargadon began to delve more deeply into the question of why the college was attempting to enroll black students in order to understand how best to go forward. As the class of 1971 was being recruited, he wrote in a memo entitled Social Diversity, I think it is safe to say that the majority of colleges and universities in the country, certainly all of the prestigious ones, presently seek socially diverse student bodies. Swarthmore, with its emphasis on and reputation for social diversity, excuse me, social consciousness, may bring to the problem of social diversity a commitment which exceeds that of the simple desire to reinforce the educational process by bringing students of different backgrounds together. The desirability of social diversity from an educational viewpoint may be reinforced by an institutional feeling of social responsibility. Hargadon says that at its basic level, the purpose of diversity is education, and any sense of social responsibility is secondary. To continue this investigation, during the summer of 1968, President Smith asked Hargadon to prepare a report on black enrollment, which assessed the success of the past four years of the Rockefeller program. It was this report that most directly led to the actions of the 1969 sit-in, as it contained very personal information on black students, aggregated as a whole, but still very personal information, and it was placed on reserve in McCabe Library for anyone to take out and see. Um, one thing that jumps out of the report is the role gender played in admissions decisions. In order to address the imbalance between the number of black men and women in higher education nationally, the Rockefeller Foundation had encouraged its grant recipients to primarily admit male students. Concerns about black male achievement were rooted in sociological research such as Daniel Patrick Moynihan's 1965 report, The Negro Family, The Case for National Action, which argued that the cause of poverty in black communities was a lack of male heads of household and the deterioration of black nuclear families. Hargadon, in fact, quoted Moynihan in his report, noting that the percent of Swarthmore black families headed by women mirrored the national statistics. Despite the Rockefeller Foundation's suggestion, the admissions office had been unable to ensure our Negro student group would be predominantly male. But the attempt to enroll as many or more men than women had profound effects for the college's admissions decisions. Hargadon explained that they had admitted all qualified black men who applied, but because after the class of 1969, there were already more black women than men in the student body, all qualified women were not accepted. In fact, there had been 12 black women on the waiting list for the class of 1972, but because a high number of the women admitted chose to enroll and a low number of the men, they were unable to take any women off of the waiting list. Rather than own this decision as one made by the admissions office influenced by policy like the Moynihan Report and entities like the Rockefeller Foundation, Hargadon consistently justified it based on what he thought black students wanted. He explained, while interracial dating occurs, the militant separatism of many of the Negro students leans against it, 
and a number of the SAS students have expressed their concern over a social situation which they consider quite limited. While a balanced gender ratio might have been preferable to black students, to execute this desire by admitting fewer women greatly misconstrues and trivializes the motivations of the students. Primarily, they were concerned with increasing the total numbers of black students. Hargadon's comments indicate that the college had an ideal, Im ideal image of what integration was in theory, but hadn't seriously examined what it looked like in practice creating a contradiction in which the college policies undermined the ideal vision. For example, as late as 1965, white students were asked if they were comfortable rooming with a Negro. Similarly, Hargadon's characterization of SAS as militant and separatist shows a disconnect with the experience of being one of about 50 black students on an otherwise nearly entirely white campus. Aside from one black faculty member, the only other black people students saw on campus were maids and the dining hall staff. In this context, the bonding together of black students and the creation of SAS was not a rejection of the theoretical ideal of integration, but rather, as one member explained, SAS is not so much a militant separatist thing as a need for a black student to retain his identity in an all-white college. In a faculty meeting shortly after the takeover, Professor Legesse, the only black faculty member, said, SAS has chosen to be a separatist body because it has been disappointed with the results of the integrationist approach. When some faculty objected to SAS's separatism, it was urged that their separatist techniques were a means of achieving an ultimately integrated position. For SAS, achieving this integrated position meant enrolling larger numbers of black students. Without more students, there was not potential for more viable black life on campus. So in response to Hargadon's argument that the admissions office could not find enough qualified black applicants, students argued both, they are out there, look harder, and we need to think about how we are assessing qualified. Hargadon was engaged in this conversation about qualifications as well. In response to his memo on social diversity, the Commission on Educational Policy had responded, a certain uniformity of background is the price of a high level of academic performance. Students who are very bright but poorly educated are difficult to assimilate into a high pressure system like Swarthmore's. We regretfully conclude that for many such students, Swarthmore is the wrong college and that this important social function can be better performed at institutions with greater resources and facilities. Though we hope the admissions office will continue to seek the sort of disadvantaged students who do seem capable of succeeding at Swarthmore. Thus, Hargadon's report a year later was essentially an assessment of this question. Could the admissions office distinguish which black applicants would be successful at Swarthmore, given the data from the past four years? But up to this point, Swarthmore had enrolled virtually no risk students, students whose SAT scores were outside of the usual range accepted by the college. Therefore, the prospect of doing so, and in particular SAS's demand that the college enroll 10 to 20 risk students for the, class of, for the 1969 70 school year, caused huge amounts of discussion. The Phoenix published a statement attributed to President Smith, Smith two days before the sit in began. He said he was sure there was no disagreement about increasing the number of black students, faculty members, and administrators. A judgment about numbers of high-risk students does involve a basic issue to be resolved by the faculty. Swarthmore College has historically defined itself as a college with a highly selected student body and a challenging academic program. In the light of current social urgencies, should the college redefine itself? And if so, to what extent and in what direction? While the college ultimately supported enrolling risk students, this was seen simultaneously as a limited special program and a massive challenge to the historical mission of the college. But in what resulted, there was no major assessment or shift of how the college thought about intellectual or challenging or how it evaluated preparedness. 10 risk students were admitted that year. Some programs were created to support them. But what was reaffirmed was the college's definition as an academically selective institution. Any action motivated by social responsibility had to fit within this framework. Hargadon expressed this struggle. How many of those places should be given over to Negro students who, while able to do the work, would gain admission largely because they are Negro? Or, if we could agree on the number of places but were unable to fill them with students who could do the work without remedial programs, what number of places could we then conscientiously set aside for such students? 
the point at which the college can meet the needs of society without sacrificing its own integrity and genius is both a sensitive and difficult one to establish. And then, because it was walking this line of ambiguity as to how to act on its social responsibility, Swarthmore began to fall back on Hargadon's more basic definition of the purpose of diversity. Remember, a sense of social responsibility was on top of diversity for the purpose of reinforcing the educational process. But it's this way of thinking about diversity that is really problematic at colleges like Swarthmore. In theory, it works. Everyone is different. Everyone learns from everyone else. But we do not live in a world of equal footing. Some students are marked as different, while others are not. This place of display is neither safe nor comfortable, as students are regularly confronted with the ignorance, stereotypes, and sometimes animosity from others whose behavior is frequently excused directly as a result of this model of diversity. It embraces the equality of viewpoints and the sanctity of all acts conducted in the pursuit of education, so touching a black student's hair becomes an analysis of culture. Asking a classmate where they are really from becomes investigative journalism. So I think that for Swarthmore to really deal with the issues of diversity that are always simmering under the surface, even in the moments that they're not boiling over, we really need to critically examine how we think about diversity, what our purpose in having a diverse student body is, and how we are going to support that purpose. I want to end with an example of the type of critical perspectives I believe we need to bring to the table. Clinton Etheridge was the chairman of SAS during the takeover, and after Hargadon's report was published in 1968, he wrote, when you talk to white students and administrators about the rationale for blacks at Swarthmore, they only give variations on the same two related themes, the integrationist ethic and social diversity. Put simply, this means something like, the white majority can best understand and appreciate the heterogeneous society in which they live if they are exposed to students from varied backgrounds. Sass sees the integrationist ethic as Swarthmore saying, we want black students so that we can see how the other half lives. The college hopes that social contact with blacks will abate the racism and prejudice of the white students. Thank you. On May 17, 1968, President Courtney Smith sent a letter to the professor and de chairman of the Department of Economics, Frank C. Pearson, thanking him for his willingness to participate in a new curricular committee designed to discuss the possible implementation of a program in black studies at the college. Pearson, who volunteered to serve as chairman of the committee, was joined by a coterie of faculty and students selected by Smith, either on the basis of their expertise or their expressed interest in the program. Five of these students, Participants were members of SAS, and a student group dedicated to the political and cultural interests of black students at the college. SAS will go on to play a more aggressive role in the formation of black studies as it gained more legitimate power after the um, successive occupation of the admissions office in, uh, in January of 1969. The faculty members of the committee were gathered from several regions of the humanities and social sciences divisions of the college, and the list consisted of five professors and instructors. For my research, I focus my attention primarily on the, on the minutes of the Black Curriculum Committee and the correspondences between students and faculty of the committee. By reading these minutes, I was able to see several reoccurring points of contention between the committee student and faculty factions. Whereas SAS's interests of the committee were in the creation of a revolutionary program in black studies, the likes of which would fashion Swarthmore into a school of black liberation, the faculty side of the committee were more interested in the passing of pr their proposal by their peers. The major hurdles of the Black Curriculum Committee can therefore be seen as four main points. The creation of and definition of black studies, the efforts of SAS to structure the program to their liking, the issue of faculty appeasement, and the problem of staffing concerns. My first point is what is black studies? Um, a relatively new thing at the time, black studies as it is frequently defined is an interdisciplinary field of study designed to address the history, culture, and politics of the black experience in America. Prior to 19, Prior to the 1960s, programs in black studies were relatively non-existent, and it wasn't until the late 60s that such programs began to emerge across the country. What black studies seeks to accomplish is to reveal a part of American culture that has often been misinterpreted, misunderstood, maligned, or deemed unimportant. The program is, in essence, a nuanced approach toward the traditional Eurocentric universalism into which academia has been firmly rooted for centuries. 
as it, at its very core, black, culture, black studies is revolutionary. It proposes that the way academia has been structured for centuries is f flawed and racist insofar that it denies the experiences of black people their legitimacy. It also posits that the history of black people as subjects and not as experimenters is a fallacy and that black people in America have contributed just as much to our image of our country as have our white compatriots. The, imp the implementation of black studies at Swarthmore would be an integration, not a, separate, not a segregation of content materials. Rather than creating a course specifically in black subject matters, black studies would be integrated into an existing course materials, surveys, and departmental re requ yeah, requirements as a means of creating a more accurate picture of American life and affairs. The integration of these materials varied across, across courses, such and some examples can be seen in the works of John Shackford in the English department, in which his survey of American literature included the works of um, Richard Wright in his book Native Son and Ralph Waldo Emerson's Invisible Man. Um, other courses like Black Political Thought, Literature et Negritude, Car Caribbean Society, and Race and Ethnic Relationships in the United States are among a few of the course selectings that appeared in the 1970 course catalog for black studies. It was discussed that black studies spanned far further than the few social sciences and humanities departments over which it overlapped with new content in music, art, and languages of the African diaspora, such as courses on African eth ethnomusicology and language courses in Yoruba and Swahili. These offerings, while ambitious, did not fit into the college's limited resources. Finally, a consortium of nearby schools was established to allow the implementation of black studies courses that would not be offered here at Lincoln and Cheney universities, and students cross-enrolled at, at those universities. The second point is, is perhaps the most contentious in the, stu in the committee, and it re involves staffing concerns. Who do we hire to teach courses on black studies? There arises the issue of perspective. What is the black perspective and how do we use perspectives in the classroom? The committee defined black perspective as twofold. First, it means special sensitivities and attitudes, especially towards problems of identity and identification. Secondly, it carries overtones of political perspectives, something that academics should probably try to overcome. In doing so, the committee is pushing the notion that the black perspective is essential to the teaching of black materials because it addresses the problem of ignorance. Content matter, which are often approached in a vacuum in the classroom, are grounded by the experience of the black professor and the black students present. The other definition, however, speaks to a more political nature of a lot of the content um, which black studies is interested in, particularly attempting to avoid the indoctrination of students into political agendas and ideologies. Prior to black studies, there had been no perspective in the classroom, going back to the universalist edict of traditional, of traditional academia. Um, the, the, then there arises the idea of the maintaining of the college's prestige um, in order to keep the grandeur of, a, of Swarthmore as a prestigious liberal arts institution. Martha Biondi, who will be here next week, um, wrote the following on black perspectives. A black perspective not only answered critics who questioned the rationale for black studies, but it also aimed to unmask the pretense of universalism in the Euro-American intellectual thought and teaching. It is vital to underscore the overwhelming Eurocentric nature of, of the American college curricula and the extent to which white scholars argued that their theories and research have universal application. Then there is the idea of the racial framework of working in a predominantly white environment as a black person. The idea of white appeasement and black assimilation and subordination in the classroom, as well as the faculty lounge, became an issue of dim diminishment of black materials in the classroom as non-academic. Joyce A. Joyce of Temple University wrote that if the black professor fears or identifies with whites, if job security is more important than honesty and integrity, the professor will devise all sorts of strategies to avoid student to avoid confrontation with students and to assure that even the poorest students receive high grades, regardless of the nature of their performances. The students, of course, expect that the professor will pass them because they cannot conceive of receiving a failing grade from a, from a black professor and in a course that they addresses issues that they see as non-academic. In saying this, Joyce is arguing that black faculty members will likely feel pressed by their students and their peers to fit traditional roles of, ac of black subordination and will limit discussions and dialogues in order to obtain job security. Professors who push too far risk losing their, professor, risk losing their professorships or not receiving tenure. There's also the, this is a problem that each department must face on its own terms. 
faculty qualifications also becomes the final problem re regarding staffing concerns. The question was raised in the minutes that I think is pretty important to highlight. Is it more important that a teacher be black than educationally qualified? This is a direct quote from the minutes of the Blacks Curriculum Committee, and I put it out there because in it is the implicitly racist idea that blackness and, and educational qualifications are mutually exclusive. But, um, and while this is somewhat true in the fact that there were a paucity of black PhD holding um, faculty members across the country, um, especially in the wake of an emerging, emerging wave of black studies programs, um, the college still was focused on creating um, this program and finding faculty members through programs across colleges and universities. The college has not been structured to allow the teaching of courses by persons without a PhD or the relevant terminal degree in their field. The paucity of black intellectuals at the time did not lend itself to a large candidate pool, nor were there these candidates being readily produced either. Black students, black studies programs have not solidified and people were leaving institutions in the 1960s with degrees in black studies. There arises the great panic of how to staff Swarthmore's black studies program in the emergence of the national push for ethnic studies. Um, finally, there's SAS's efforts to structure black studies in the black representation on campus in the wake of the 1969 protest. Black students often complained about the lack of black faces on Swarthmore's campus. One alum wrote, I think one of the things that struck me almost immediately was that all the black adults on campus were gardeners and cooks and dorm keepers, and that struck me right away. It wasn't unfamiliar. I was, just, I was used to seeing black and blue collar subservient service roles growing up, but it, wasn't striking that, but it was striking that there was no black teachers and no black administrators. As such, SAS's role in the Black Curriculum Committee was focused around the creation of a body of faculty intrinsically connected to the black students on campus, with members even going so far as to propose that SAS members have a formal veto power in the hiring process. The faculty members cringed at the idea of black students vetoing a possible candidate, especially when members in the committee complained about the hiring of offensive Uncle Toms to the faculty. To SAS, black studies offered a window for black students to become empowered in the pedagogical affairs to, and to build bridges across the factions of student and faculty at the college. If courses were taught that SAS members viewed as unsatisfactory, the, they would boycott the courses in the wake of, and in the wake of the two occupations in January 1969 and the subsequent occupation of the president's office in March of 1970, this became a very serious threat to the members of the committee. It was understood also that although black studies courses would be an open to everyone on campus, mostly black students would be taking black studies courses anyways. If all the black studies, if all the black students belong to one particular student organization, the possibility for mobilization becomes infinitely easier. This applied pressure on the faculty side of the committee for it would reflect poorly on them and the college if a dissatisfactory course be implemented. My last point is the appeasement of the faculty. At the college, all, fa all academic policy is passed by the faculty. Despite SAS's fortitude and zeal, it was ultimately up to the, pro to the professoriate of the college to pass academic policy. SAS members tended to be more rigorous in their approaches towards the creation of black cities proposals, while the faculty members of the committee were more focused on getting the proposal passed. This is a pretty significant shift or significant um, dynamic in the, in the committee because one side was rather aggressive in its language and the other side was rather conservative in its attempt to, to get the academic policy passed. Um, one particular example that I found kind of funny was um, that the, in one of the proposals written by Clinton Etheridge who was present, um, the idea of ritualistically amassing sheepskins is written, um, which talks to the actual degree process and the faculty members of the committee were very much against this language and said that they could not present this to the faculty or else it would not get passed. Um, the problem was not what should black studies at Swarthmore look like as much as it, to these members of the committee but how can we make black studies at Swarthmore work? Um, Ultimately, the Black Studies program was approved by the faculty and the courses were offered in the then concentration in the 1969-1970 school year. Several SAS members, some of which are present right now, were the first students to graduate from the college with concentrations in Black Studies and have paved the way for the program as it is today. Several programs also emerged from the Black Studies program, including the Asian Studies program and the Latin American Studies program. Um, 
and Black Studies has continued to flourish as a program at the college today. Thank you. Thank you all for being here today. Ooh. Uh, my name is Maria Mejia, and I'm not sure I'll get another opportunity to say this, so I just want to make sure everyone knows how much I appreciate that all of you have been here today, that people have been looking at the digital archive, and just the general support that we've been getting. I especially want to thank all of our guests for being here today, and to thank the alumni of SAS who have remained uh, involved in this project and are here today. Um, I will be discussing my research project, Perspectives on Class in the Black Student Movement at Swarthmore College from 1968 to 1973. Now, as this title suggests, I'm going to be an analyzing class and how that shaped black students' experiences at Swarthmore and their activism. First, I will explain the role of socioeconomic class in the admissions of black students from the perspectives of the college administrators and others outside of class. Obviously, this is important because admissions determines who is at the college and who then becomes involved in the black campus movement. Second, I'm going to highlight the interviews of three alumni who exemplify the spectrum of competing narratives that I notice. And these alumni are Marilyn Allman May, class of 1969, Russell Frisbee, class of 1972, and Rosalind Plummer Wood, class of 1973. I have found that black student activists recognize the importance of socioeconomic class in addressing racial problems at Swarthmore, but that their very perspectives on class issues resulted in competing narratives. Now, this might seem very obvious. Of course, people experience class differently. Their memories are going to reflect that. But to me, it goes beyond that. Some of you might have heard Clinton Etheridge, class of 1969, refer to class to SAS as middle class reformers. Now, this assertion seems to undermine uh, Marilyn Allman May's description of the Seven Sisters, uh, the found, some of the founding members of SAS, as a group of black women who bonded because, quote, we were all on scholarship and our families were kind of normal as, fine, as, as far as socioeconomic stuff. On top of that, you have Dean Frederick Hargadon, who uh, my colleagues have discussed in detail, um, and his report, which character characterized SAS as a group of med middle class Negroes, but not reformers. Um, for him, class was um, a separatist organization of agitators who were destroying the campus and preventing the admissions of other black students. To make sense of these conflicting accounts, I will share a quote from historian Ibram X. Kendi's text, The Black Campus Movement, in which he linked the political engagement of black students to issues of socioeconomic status. Quote, in the process of exploring their blackness and Africanity to, through black power principles, literature, and speakers, another identity crisis oftentimes surfaced. The contradiction of the contemporary ideas of blackness socially responsible, working class centered, politically and culturally nationalist, and the hypothesized historic notions of student identity, bourgeois, socially irresponsible, and politically and culturally assimilationist. Hypothesize is a key word here. Kendi is not arguing that black students suddenly became politically and socially aware during the 1960s. What he argues is that the incorporation of what uh, can be labeled black power principles into the black campus movement, put these students at odds with the depoliticized identity associated with socially mobile people. Now at Swarthmore, there was an expectation that black students would be grateful to attend such a liberal and progressive and prestigious college and that they would assimilate to the college's environment in order to be successful. How do we know this? Well, for better or worse, Dean Hargadon laid it all out in his September 1968 report. Um, first, he explained that generally, Swarthmore recruited and enrolled non-risk students. Now, Laura has defined the term for us, so I'm not going to repeat it, but I will explain what that meant for those who were risk. 
The students who were not admitted, black risk students, were excluded because they did not meet the academic qualifications of the college. So what's the problem? Swarthmore is a small school. We cannot admit everyone. Not everyone should go here, right? Well, the problem is that Hargitin explicitly linked grades, SAT scores, and class rank to family income and socioeconomic class background. He wrote, most of the research in this area has shown a positive correlation between socioeconomic status and objective measures of educational achievement. This is not to imply that there are no highly academically qualified students from poor families, but to reach them requires extraordinary recruitment efforts of the kind which, up to now, we have expended largely on behalf of the Negro students. So again, we see this dichotomy between qualified and black and the additional dichotomy of black, qualified, and low income. In other words, Hargadon felt that it would be nearly impossible to admit students who could do the work of Swarthmore, who were black, and who were also from poor families. Just not possible. Um, Diane Batsmaro from the class of 1969, a black student who was not in SAS and who opposed the 1969 sit-in, supported the, admissions, uh, the administration's approach to admission. Um, although she was involved in the upward, brown, upward bound recruitment program in Chester, Diane Batsmaro felt that specifically targeting low income risk students was unnecessary and upheld negative stereotypes about African Americans. Her sense was there are plenty of black people in this country, there are plenty of black students who can come to Swarthmore. Going to Harlem or to Compton was racist and stereotypical. Um, SAS disagreed and they pushed the college to admit more students who were from inner city um, backgrounds and who would be defined as risk students. Although the college's recruitment processes resulted in little socioeconomic diversity amongst black students, their views on class did vary widely. This is the part where I'm going to transition into talking about the interviews and some of the conflicting narratives that we saw during this process. Now, in one of the interviews included in the May 1994 issue of the Swarthmore College Bulletin, Marilyn Allman May describes how her time at Swarthmore and her involvement with SAS and with the 1969 uh, sit-in were shaped by an understanding of her own class background and her connection with the college's black employees. At the time, most of the black people on campus, on campus were of the janitorial staff. Marilyn Allman May said, the, work, the workforce on campus was almost all African American. Middle-aged people overqualified for their jobs, people of substance in their community. But at Swarthmore, they were called by their first names, and every one of them was supervised by a white person. When I first arrived on campus, the lady who cleaned the dorm was the person I felt closest to, yet she had no standing at the college. No one knew anything about her but her name. Now, Marilyn Almond May seems to portray one very specific uh, image of how black students interacted with black uh, staff and how they understood themselves. In her narrative, there was a cooperative relationship between SAS and the black janitorial staff, and there was a connection. So when Marilyn Allman May saw the black worker who cleaned the dorms being disrespected, she felt that some of that disrespect was being directed at her as someone who was also black and who was also working class. Now, this narrative has been challenged by other alumni as somewhat romanticized. Russell Frisbee remembered a more antagonistic relationship between black students and black working class staff. He was a freshman during the 1969 sit-in, and he remembered one of the women who worked cleaning parish coming to the door, banging on the door, and yelling at the students to get out. According to him, she, she felt that they were wrong and that they would get all the black people on campus in trouble and that they would ruin the school with their actions. 
For him, who as a middle class person, this is how he identified, for him, there was a stronger connection between the black students and the black um, white collar staff. Now, my goal is not to say that one narrative is more correct than the other or to suggest that any of these things are wrong. Black students were not a monolith and neither were the black working class staff, so it is possible that both of these things were happening simultaneously. What does that mean? That it is probably true that Marilyn Allman May was having this deep connection with the black workers on campus and that Russell Frisbee had a very different relationship with the same group of people. Now the third alumni whose interview I analyzed had more of a more of a complex understanding of the relationship between black students and their class backgrounds. Rosalind Plummer Wood's narrative is somewhere in the middle of the spectrum. She explained that as a daughter of a domestic worker, she was offended by the disrespectful treatment black custodial workers faced from the administration who refused to pay fair wages and from students who refused to clean their rooms and address them properly. In that sense, there is some connections between what Marilyn Allman May said and what Rosalind Plummer Wood said. However, Rosalind Plummer Wood also revealed tensions that arose when SAS attempted to organize against the treatment of the maid service workers. So what happened was that instead of letting the maids come into their individual rooms and clean it, some members of SAS decided to clean the rooms themselves and to through this um, action, advocate for better treatment for these workers. Unfortunately, their action had unintended negative consequences. The college decided, in the words of Ross and Plummer Wood, no need means no job. In other words, all of those women who worked as maids on campus were fired. Obviously, this resulted in a very tense relationship between SAS, other black students, and the black working class staff. However, it is important to analyze these issues and these tensions and recognize that there was a connection between organizing around racial diversity and organizing around socioeconomic diversity. These competing narratives about class revealed not only that students were, black students were struggling with themselves, with their position in the college, but also struggling with the administration, who was very much determined to maintain a certain kind of image. Um, Swarthmore definitely prided itself on its liberalism, on its work in Chester, on its Quaker heritage, but felt that there was only a certain kind of student who would do well here. To conclude, I want to talk about what the implications are for today. I feel that whenever we talk about racial issues or class issues um, in history, there is a tendency to make connections to the present. Um, for example, at Swarthmore, um, the EVS workers, that means the black janitorial staff, is still the largest group of black people on campus. I'm going to say it again. Um, when you walk around Swarthmore, most of the black people that you will see, most of the Latino people that you will see will be mowing the grass or cleaning the dorms. There is no shame in this work, but I think it says a lot about our school that this is where the majority of black people are concentrated. Furthermore, the college is still struggling to recruit students who are qualified and black and low income. However, this does not mean that things are exactly the same. The demographics of Swarthmore have changed. Today you have Afro-Latina students from low-income backgrounds walking around the campus and speaking at presentations and stuff like that. Um, so the conversation needs to change. We need to talk about what it means for this college to pride itself on certain values, but not necessarily uphold those values when it comes to admissions. We need to talk about what it means for black students to get together and have conversations about racism, but not talk about class. Uh, we need to talk about what it means to invite students from Chester, students from the Bronx, students from Harlem, students from wherever to our campus, but not invite them to attend our school. To conclude, I just want to 
<laughs> Thank you all again for supporting this project. Um, and to remind you all that it has taken 45 years for this project to take place. Um, I'm, a, I'm a little repetitive, so I'm just going to say that again. It's taken 45 years for the college to talk to these alumni, to explore these issues, to collect these documents in a digital archive. I hope that it does not take another 45 years or another 150 years to take the next step. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ali Schultes, and today I want to offer a theory about why it's taken us 45 years to um, talk about the SAS occupation of 1969. Um, when I began my research for Professor Allison Dorsey's course, I didn't expect to find an answer to this question. I thought that forgetting is kind of a passive act, and that's probably what happened. Um, at the most, maybe the college was a little irresponsible in not trying to tell this story in a more explicit way. But what I found from studying the faculty minutes from January 1969 and looking at the Phoenix supplements that were produced during SAS's occupation of the admissions office from January 9th through January 16th is that from the time SAS occupied the admissions office, certain members of the faculty were involved in a willing act of erasure of their, of their role in bringing about change at the college. So the college never forgot the story of SAS's occupation. It just never really told it at all. Um, so in order to demonstrate uh, this argument, um, I'm going to basically reconstruct the first week of SAS's occupation from the faculty minutes and also from the Phoenix Supplement. Um, before doing that, I'm going to lay out the difference in two key documents that um, play a role in how the, who the faculty argues is coming up with the changes um, during this time period. And then I'm going to zoom ahead two months and look at how some of the faculty are narrating what happened during January 1969. So in the fall of 1968, uh, we heard from Laura a lot about Harganon and his report on student admissions. Um, this report was largely a study on the black students already enrolled at the college and didn't really offer recommendations for increasing black student enrollment. So after the report was published, an admissions policy committee was formed, which was its job was to take the Harganon report as a working paper and come up with resolutions that the faculty, the admissions office could then adopt when enrolling black students. Um, Fred Harganon served as the chair, and since his paper served as the working paper, there was a lot of similarity in terms of the tone of the overall document. Basically, a lot of time was spent devoted to questioning why we want black students and what their purpose would be at the school. Um, it did put forward some resolutions, but a lot of these were pretty ambiguous. One resolution, for example, said we need to have some sort of black adult figure for the black students um, so that they can talk to them. But that doesn't specify uh, <laughs> what exactly that role is going to look like. Um, so this document was released in December of 1968. Um, also in the fall of 1968, SAS released three different sets of demands. They all sort of spoke to each other and clarified each other. The first was released in October. Um, it was a response to the Hargadon report. Um, SAS issued a clarified set of demands on December 23rd, which it sent to President Smith right before the re winter holiday. And then when SAS occupied the admissions office on uh, January 9th, they published a, a, a third set of demands. But they, again, they were all related um, and clarified one another. Um, so when the faculty returned from winter holiday um, and met on January 7th to discuss the demands that were sent to President Courtney Smith, there, there were some claims made in the minutes about how the admissions policy report and the SAS demands uh, were similar in, in their goals and objectives. They weren't um, really at all. Um, but there was an understanding in this meeting that uh, at the next faculty meeting, the faculty would adopt the demands of SAS as their working paper. Um, so actually look at the demands and respond to them and address them. Uh, two days later, SAS occupied the admissions office, and the next day the faculty met at, thinking they were going to discuss SAS demands, only to have the uh, secretary to the agenda committee, Helen North, uh, present an agenda that was entirely based on the admissions policy report. Um, faculty at the time recognized what was going on. Um, Pro Assistant Professor Richard Schuldenfried, who was untenured at the time, said, this agenda does not address itself specifically to those demands. Um, and the faculty minutes say, um, other faculty members agreed and were disappointed that this agenda does not include essential points made by SAS. 
Um, one of the biggest discrepancies between the two documents was the, the role of um, black professionals in the decision-making process, or the role of any black perspective in the decision-making process of the school. Um, SAS wanted black representation on all levels um, of decision-making processes, um, and the admissions policy report doesn't address that. So that was absent from this schedule as proposed. Um, President Courtney Smith put the schedule up to a vote and a motion passed that said we're going to still address Helen North's um, proposed schedule, which, which was not based on SAS demands. Um, so during this time, after SAS occupied the admissions office, white students and black students who hadn't yet entered the admissions office were meeting in plenary sessions to discuss what was happening, um, to discuss how they were going to support SAS, but also to discuss student power, which had been a big issue on campus for during the 1960s. Um, so there was a lot of talk not only about supporting, but also how they were going to get more representation on the faculty. Um, and this is very explicit from the first Phoenix supplements. Um, so the faculty is probably a little anxious about this at the, at the time as well. Um, so following the meeting on uh, January 10th, when, when it's decided that the, the faculty will be addressing the admissions policy report, um, there's a meeting on the morning of January 11th in which faculty members basically come to talk about the faculty meetings in front of students. Um, in the morning plenary session, one of the faculty members talks about how fast the faculty is moving to address SAS demands. They're saying, like, we're doing a good job, you know, like, we're, we're doing the best we can under the circumstances. But a second professor claimed the faculty was still reluctant to consider the problems as broadly and as quickly as it should. Um, this appears to have caused some anxiety in the faculty meeting uh, following the plenary session. Um, this is a direct quote from the minutes. Questions were raised as to the accuracy of reports of faculty attitudes and actions that are being made by individual faculty members to students or groups of students. The president deplored the negative nature of some reports made by faculty members to students and urged faculty to indicate that they were speaking for themselves and not for the faculty as a whole. Um, since neither professor claimed they were speaking for the faculty as a whole, I think it's safe to say that President Smith was actually saying, please don't critique the faculty in front of the students. Um, Following that faculty meeting, there was an afternoon uh, student plenary session. Um, in the Phoenix Supplements report from this uh, session, uh, it's described as Dean of Men Robert Barr's um, defense of the faculty me meetings. So you get this sense that they're really under attack from the white students. Um, so Dean Robert Barr starts off as kind of the first meeting start off, started off and just said, we're doing the best we can to address SAS demands. At this point, Richard Schuldenfree, again, uh, assistant untenured professor, um, said, quote, not a single demand of SAS per se has been accepted, which it hadn't because they were working off the admissions policy report and not SAS demands. Um, at this point, President Smith intervened and asked the secretary to the faculty to read the resolutions that had been passed thus far by um, the faculty, um, which still isn't addressing Sheldon Free because those resolutions were still not addressing SAS demands. Um, so subsequent to this meeting, um, they go back to the faculty and they start talking about how they're going to kind of appease the white students who are asking for increased communication and dialogue with the faculty. During that afternoon plenary session, white students had requested that reporters from the Phoenix and WSRN were allowed into the faculty meetings to kind of report on what was going on. They also asked Dean Robert Barr to put forward a motion um, for like live broadcasting or videotaping of the faculty minutes um, for greater transparency. Uh, the motion for videotaping never made it to the floor, um, and the motion for Phoenix or WSRN reporter, w, yeah, WSRN reporters was uh, voted down, um, unsurprisingly. So how the faculty solved this problem of communication was they established a committee, which was responsible for writing up all the res, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which was responsible for writing up all the resolutions that the faculty passed, and then that document was sent to the secretary of the faculty, which was then passed to the student body. Um, so what we see from this is that the, the faculty really locked down on, the, on their meeting spaces, and, and definitely from, from white students as, as well as black students in this moment, again, probably in response to these demands for student power. Um, but there are some other things going on in these early days of the faculty me meetings. Um, for the first three days on um, January 10th, 11th, and 12th, um, SAS Chairman Clinton Etheridge and also unaffiliated black students were invited in front of the faculty to present on issues that they saw happening on campus and to talk about SAS demands. Um, one thing we learned from an interview with um, Professor Thompson Bradley, who was interviewed for the database, is that not all of the faculty remained in the room when the black students came in to address them. This is a quote from his interview. 
Some of the faculty members who were most grievously affronted by this got up and walked out when Etheridge came in. This is really a very, very sad commentary. They refused to listen, refused to see, refused to hear, and they did that every time he came into the meeting. He'd lay out the things they had to, they had to say, and then he would leave. And the people who walked out would come back, and the discussion would begin again. So you have people who are leaving the space as SAS representatives are entering, and then re-entering once they've gone. So they can imagine that they're just addressing this admissions policy report and the recommendations of their fellow faculty members instead of addressing the black students who are involved in the occupation. But this doesn't go on for long. Again, the black students are invited in for the first three days, and then the faculty declares themselves done working through SAS demands because they've moved through Helen North's uh, schedule. Um, but since Helen North's schedule did not address the issue of black, student, or black representation on all decision-making levels of the college, uh, they actually hadn't addressed SAS demands, so SAS refused to leave um, the admissions office. So at this point, the faculty claims they don't know what to do and they, they don't understand why they haven't addressed SAS demands yet. So they establish a faculty SAS liaison group. Um, so instead of inviting SAS members into the faculty now, they have three white men and the one black faculty member, Asmaram Legesi, uh, take the resolutions that were produced by the faculty to SAS, work on the resolutions, and then bring back the resolutions to the faculty minutes. Um, again, completely erasing SAS as, as a body that's generating um, these changes. Um, and now you have white men talking about um, how they understand SAS's goals um, and, and representing that to the faculty. Um, so at this point, I'm going to skip ahead two months. Um, during this time, uh, Swarthmore was getting a lot of pretty bad coverage. Um, part of my creative project is producing a Phoenix supplement that some of you may have seen around campus today. The back side of that has a list of some of the headlines and quotes, and it's pretty uh, horrific. Um, but two months after the occupation, the Wall Street Journal publishes an article called Cool Colleges, Two Liberal Schools Decide Campus Turmoil Was Worth the Trouble, which was actually applauding SAS for bringing about like much needed change um, at the school, including uh, student representation on committees, um, as well as uh, hiring black professionals and um, increasing black student enrollment, or increasing the lines for black student enrollment, as we've heard, we're still not quite at the uh, bar that they set um, in 1969. Um, so you would expect the faculty to be kind of happy about this happy coverage that they got um, in the wake of all the negative coverage. Um, Two professors uh, responded to the Wall Street Journal by writing back to the, uh, to the author. One of them was Helen North. Um, I'm going to quote from her letter. More serious is the equally false impression given by your article that only because of the occupation of the Swarthmore Admissions Office were certain changes made in the policy regarding the admissions of black students. The Special Admissions Policy Committee submitted its report recommending many of the changes that were later presented as non-negotiable demands by SAS. Um, the report was scheduled for consideration by the faculty at its meeting in the first week of January. Um, so I also want to address uh, a statement that was made by Thompson, uh, Thompson Bradley in his interview that he saw a large part of the faculty body as being really passive in this and maybe not supporting SAS but also maybe not, um, maybe not detracting kind of from what they're trying to accomplish. And I think um, the fact that we've lost the narrative of what happened and the fact that um, this kind of erasure was going on in the faculty, and as Helen North was presenting these motions that weren't addressing SAS demands, some other faculty members stepped up and presented motions that said explicitly, like, hey, why don't we address the word for, like, the word, for word demands of SAS and pass those instead, and were voted down. I think it's a, a, maybe a more sinister story than just that the faculty was largely passive. Um, and I think all of this has uh, significant implications for how we think of ourselves as a school. Um, and when we talk about institutional memory, we're talking about the memory of the faculty and the administration. And when the faculty and the administration is set on viewing Swarthmore as a liberal, progressive place, then it kind of le follows that they think of themselves as a, as a liberal, progressive body. And, um, and they can erase the students, kind of, who, who, who actually generated the change. Um, thank you.